So hi. <clears throat> so first off, uh, I wanted to thank the organizers um, for you know setting this all up. I think it's really really important, and uh, in particular Francesco for uh, you know inviting me and having me here. Uh, it is my pleasure to to contribute to this. So. Um, this talk uh, was actually uh, put together with uh, a, a colleague, uh, Matteo Hessel, and uh, but I get to present it today. So, uh, but the work this is joint work. So this is the structure of, of the talk. Um, I will start by kind of justifying why uh, I decided to talk about research engineering in the first place. Um, and then I'll try to convince you that research engineering is in itself a very exciting like dis discipline and something that is worth like investing for your, you know, for your PhD, for your master's and for your job. Um, and then I will share like my experience, like in uh, developing my, my jobs. And uh, really this talk is like a, like a laundry list of things that I would have really liked to know at the beginning of my uh, PhD um because it would have saved me a lot of time so yeah it's really like a long list of mistakes okay so um so full disclosure these are like a very personal opinions so you know don't take it as you know like uh facts and if you disagree feel free to interrupt me ask question yeah <clears throat> so uh i firmly believe that ai research uh, isn't about like a theoretical construct. Um, you know, I think our goal is actually to build like a real artifact, like a, an intelligence acting in the real world. And, uh, and this notes like reflect, like this perspective. Um, I really believe that, you know, AI research needs a very strong engineering mindset from the get go. And it's not like something to be pushed back at, a, at the final implementation stage, say. Um, even if it is just to filter out like implausible ideas from you know the space of things you might want to work on. Um, so yeah, these are really lessons that Matteo and I have picked up uh, working together like at DeepMind over the, like, over the years, uh, where we really followed like, we've been very careful always on working on ideas that were you know, plausible as in terms of real world implementation and uh, scalable. Okay, so why why research engineering? Um, rather than trying to go start from the abstract, I try to go straight into like a problem space uh, that I personally find uh, extremely fascinating. Uh, and that I really think <clears throat> shows how research and engineering progress go hand in hand and are tightly Tightly coupled. So scaling matters. Um, so in the last few years, I've been very, very involved in making it easier uh, for my colleagues and for myself in research at Google Demand in you know in scaling up their experiments with a focus perhaps on mostly on RL and most recently like in uh, RL from human feedback. And this is like been a pretty exciting, you know, uh, journey. And I hope to be able to convey how much fundamentally creativity and focus uh, our research community has put into making, uh, you know, uh, the recent progress in the field a reality. How many of you are familiar with this plot or seen this figure before? Cool. So uh, this is a, like a, a figure from an older paper by OpenAI, uh, and I'm glad some of you are already familiar with this. Uh, and uh, they capture a phenomenon called uh, double descent. So uh, I won't claim I actually understand like what is behind this. In fact, I believe that a few uh, would claim that. But you know, this is my how I take this. So in a nutshell, on the on the right hand side, uh, we see like test performance for a ResNet um, as a function of effectively its number of parameters on the x-axis and training epochs on the y-axis. Uh, and on, on the left, 
like there are training dynamics uh, for models in three regimes. Basically, they are like three columns out from the of the matrix on the right hand side. Now, the the curve from the for the right is uh, for very large models, um, and uh, and we can see that the test error first decreases, then increases, and then decreases again. Hence, you know the double double descending. So I remember seeing this picture for the first time. And personally, it was quite a, a pivotal moment, like for me. Um, you now the paper didn't quite offer explanations on why these training behavior dynamics are happening, but you know, to me, it was screaming that there is like a whole regime of training for large models with enormous untapped potential, um, and it was worth trying to work there. Now, since then, so here's the kick. Uh, a lot of work has been done in trying to attempt to understand like these dynamics for given compute and data budgets, uh, with especially basically with the benefit <clears throat> of being able to attempt, you know, to predict their performance. So, you know, you're trying to model and being able to uh, you know, make educated guesses on how the model will perform before you actually train it. Uh, so here there are two references about this kind of this space. One is from a colleague at the mind and the other is from OpenAI. So what this means in practice for me is that you can actually try to make serious attempts at training really huge models, which in practice you may be able to, you know, to train only a handful of times because they are really, really expensive and be able to build powerful tools on top of them. So this is super exciting. Okay, so it all sounds great, but it turns out that scaling is, is really hard. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult challenge, both from an engineering perspective and a research perspective. In fact, you know, because it typically requires orchestrating like a cluster of accelerators to perform every single like synchronized calculation. So a lot of thought goes into making this happen. But fear not. So we, we are engineers and we're a tool. And if tools are not there, we just build a new one better suited to what we want to do. And we have to try to tackle the problem. So, um, you know, now we're going to go for like a long, like a, a very quick, you know, like a view of a number of advances in different, you know, uh, like subfields. So one obvious like space, uh, which is like an impressive area of continuous development, of course, is the design of better hardware for machine learning. You know, every, you know, early deep learning systems um, use the general purpose graphics card designed for, you know, for gaming or for uh, VFX or, you know, um, graphics applications. But now the design, you know, the, 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 the design of custom accelerators is a whole massive industry like reflected in the stock price of uh, NVIDIA. Um, you know, there is, um, there are custom accelerators like uh, like TPUs, like uh, uh, from Google, there are IPUs, this company called GraphCore in the UK, of course, like better and better GPU designs. And actually, I was thinking this morning that uh, there are also chips for uh, for phones designed with you know to be uh, performant for ML you know inference, um, but like modern laptops like are designed from the get go to support good inference, you know, like the the Apple Silicon I think. Uh, but crucially, crucially for uh, for people like us, it's not only about uh, we're all computing power or flops. Uh, you know, there is also other aspects that are perhaps more subtle. For example, how fast the interconnection between accelerator is. Uh, and even more importantly, how accelerators are programmed. It really translates on how easy it is to get, you know, stuff done. Um, and there is a lot of research, you know, like on enabling the research to basically break the mold and develop new ideas. It's quite interesting how 
the research is really at the boundary of what you can do. And often, you know, this means that the tooling is, is not quite there. Okay. Um, so let's look at a few ideas uh, that I kind of think are interesting and demonstrate like the, the big diversity and variety of problems we have to tackle in machine learning uh, research, so deep learning in particular. Um, the first, which I think is really cool, is uh, machine learning specific compilation, um, which really means granting us the, the possibility to describe programs at a high level uh, in a platform independent language and then push the, you know, the burden of um, actually targeting a specific accelerators down to a compiler level. For example, using XLA. Um, have, how many people here have used the uh, JAX before? That's the right call. Uh, yes, um, JAX G2 is one is like, a, it's a, it's like a, it's an example. I remember the first time I tried, you know, like it was like mind blowing how easy it was to just sketch ideas out in like in Python and you know seen like the discrete jumping performance and then being able to use the same code to very easily target you know like, like CPU on your, on your workstation or a GPU or you know, TPUs on in the in the cloud. Um, this is the wrong yes. The second which is tightly um Tied to the previous slide is the uh, the development of primitives to make things like vectorization and data parallelism easier. Um, in a nutshell, you know, lets you think and write code is very readable because it's like you write it unbatched, and then you transform the underlying graph so that uh, you get for free like a, a batched like function meaning a function that takes as he input a batch of data and returns like a batch of outputs. Um, and in fact, uh, it can automatically map data and computation to multiple accelerators for you, handling communication uh, and injecting the appropriate synchronization logic when necessary, for example, to perform reductions. Uh, like you do when you want to get a loss out of uh, you know, a batch of data. Any questions so far? Okay, tell me if I'm, uh, you know, making you sleep. Try to change tone. Um, okay. <clears throat> uh, sorry. Oh yes. So I should look more at the slide here. So let me show. Um, can you read the text, or is too the font is too tiny? Okay. So uh, this figure. Is from uh, a paper that um, were for a project that Matteo and I worked together on called um, Pod Racer. It is like an agent architecture designed to run on, on TPU. And uh, and and the code I find the code extremely elegant and really shows everything I just said in this slide. So this is like the function that captures like generating data and then uh, doing a parameter update. Like in the first line, we call VMAP to automatically um, vectorize like the stepping up that in function. So you write the code as if it was, uh, you are getting like a, like a, like an unbatched version of the data. The second line captures like a for loop in a way that uh, lets you compile the whole loop uh, so that you never have to break out of, basically never return from the TPU. You can you never have to go back to Python in between calls in the loop. And the last function, last call is into PMAP. This is to map the computation to um, um, different calls of your TPU or your you know, cluster of, of um, or GPU on a single host. It's like the first time I've seen demos of this, like it was very mind blowing. You know, I remember my PhD, like uh, I did a lot of work in MATLAB, and I would say that quite a lot of time was invested into vectorizing things by hand. Um, it's quite interesting that a few years later, this can be done as well. 
like automatically. Almost is gone. Okay. So um, let's continue like looking at scaling. Um, I would say that there are perhaps two central paradigms for scaling uh, deep neural network training to uh, to multiple hardware accelerators. Um, data parallelism, which you know I mentioned later, where you know training like a mini batch of data is split across multiple workers, and model or tensor tensor parallelism, in which like the memory usage and the computation is, is distributed across uh, multiple workers. Um, so there's a typo there. Uh, I really recommend uh, checking out the, the blog post that is referenced in the slide because it's a super ni nice summary. You can go through it in half an hour and get a lot of signal from there. Uh, I guess the, the observation is that um, as be models become larger, you will eventually hit uh, a limit where, you know, model would just not fit into a single modern processor. And we require some additional memory management techniques. Uh, so very quickly get to a point where data parallelism alone is not enough. Um, like in this figure, um, there is like a quite nice visual representation uh, of um, or like or the basic idea behind the uh, these different approaches to uh, uh, um, to parallelism, and including like two versions like pipeline parallelism and expert parallelism that I won't touch now. Okay, uh, let's look at a, at a classic example of a model parallelism. Um, uh, Sander talked about this yesterday i'll try to go perhaps a bit deeper um uh, let's see how this goes so uh this is interesting because it is very tied to a specific architecture so this is a technique which is designed specifically for transformers so in a nutshell uh, megatron really circumvents the limitation that the model must put entirely like on one worker uh, using like an intralayer model parallel approach uh, that, that you see going to get you to be able to train with the models without billions of parameters. So uh, it exploits the inherent structure in the transform uh, in the transformer. Uh, and it's interesting because it doesn't require uh, breaking out to custom C++ code or using specific compilers. Uh, they're just um, uh, very relatively simple changes in the modern implementation. Uh, in fact, you can implement it by effectively including two simple synchronization primitives uh, in the MLP and in the self-attention blocks of the transformer. So they are... Oh. Right, yeah. This one and this one for the MLP. Uh, for the MLP, they are two like single or reduced operation. Um, one in the forward pass here, and one for the backward pass here. Um, and what it does is to the goal is basically to alleviate the memory pressure and increase the amount of parallelism independently of the micro batch size. Um, are you familiar with the, have you ever read the paper or try to look more uh, in depth at what Megatron does? Uh, the idea is that, you know, you start from looking at uh, basically matrix multiply uh, works and, 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 and very carefully break the computation across columns and rows in a clever way so that like in the in the two calls of the two layers of the of, of the MLP, you minimize the number of synchronization steps you need. So you start by uh, breaking it down um, um, along the columns, and then the second is done along the rows. And in this way, basically, you can break down the metric multiply and the intermediate uh, nonlinearity in a way that lets you do as much computation as you can on a single like worker and synchronize only at the end. And the same applies for the backward pass. You need to synchronize only at the very end. 
uh, and similar ideas are used for the uh, set attention. Um, if I have to try to summarize all of this, or what the principle here is that um, what exactly what Sander said uh, yesterday, that computer, you know, compute is faster, uh, communications and memory access are slower. So you're you're trying to uh, manipulate uh, the computation so that you know the like the TPUs or the GPUs are always busy um, and uh, and minimize the downtime or transfer and communication between GPUs or TPUs. Um, of course, there's more, much more than this. Uh, another interesting um, things to look at if you uh, want to try to have a deep dive into relevant papers is uh, uh, rematerialization or gradient checkpoint, which yet again is a technique for trading off memory and throughput. And the idea in this case is to recompute activations in the backward pass or selecting what uh, activation is worth uh, storing. Uh, in the forward pass to reduce memory requirements, to reduce the memory footprint. Another interesting uh, technique is zero. So have you heard of zero before? No, the number of hands is decreasing rapidly. Um, okay, uh, so zero stands for uh, zero redundancy optimizer. In a nutshell, like uh, the paper, which again, I recommend you at least to skim through, is that the, the authors here looked at how the memory was actually used in existing uh, system or at least system at the time for training and noted that basically like memory utilization fell roughly into buckets. Um, one, the bigger one uh, is occupied by the model state. So the state of the when you are optimizing like a model includes, of course, the optimizer state and uh, the model parameters and the gradients. Um, and something interesting is that actually the optimizer state for you know optimizers like uh, Adam or anything with you know the fusion momentum tends to be in fact larger than the actual um, parameter. So typically you're gonna end up with like two or three parameters per model parameter. So it's, it's very, very large. And there are many memories consumed by activations and temporary buffers or in general, uh, memory is not really usable because it's very fragmented. Uh, and then in the, in, in the paper, they devise a strat like a number of strategies to attack all like the, all of, all of this memory utilization, um, effectively partitioning, the optimizer state, the gradients, and the parameters. So, you know, if you're running on on a cluster of GPUs, it means that the you're gonna have the optimizer state distributed, not replicated, like in uh, across the devices. So, there's only only a subset of the parameters and the and the gradients, and the optimizer state lives on a device, and you need to keep passing them around at the right time. And you typically leverage the like uh, optimizers like XLA to work out where to insert. Uh, communication during the forward pass, in the backward pass. Um, also, uh, uh, zero is um, uh, um, strategies for optimizing activation memory, identifying and removing activation replication through activation partitioning. Um, uh, there is, um, sorry. Oh, yes, like if you want to go really deep, uh, the second reference uh, looks at how tensor partitioning works in uh, in Jack's Pidget. And it's, um, it gives you enough detail to really understand how things work. Um, it's really powerful. Okay. Of course, you know, um, scaling up like a transformer or models is not the whole story. So if any of the works on RL, for example, like you realize that, okay, you know, um, the model is one component of a larger training system, or you might even have like system where you have multiple networks uh, that you want to use uh, as a, like for inference, or um, want to train all them jointly. 
So you need to also scale up and handle um, the designing like a, a whole system or a whole program. Here I want to plug two libraries uh, that I think uh, everybody here who's from like here at mind uh, like uses regularly and probably my Francesco can confirm. One is um, Launchpad and the, and the other is Reverb. Um, so Launchpad is a, is a library that effectively simplifies writing distributed programs uh, and launching them very, really seamlessly, uh, seamlessly on different platforms. Um, for example, making it really easy to switch between like local execution and distributed execution, meaning that you can debug and develop on your machine and then uh, launch at scale on, on a cluster. Um, <clears throat> so the cool thing is that in so Launchpad introduces a programming model that represents like a distributed system as a, as a graph data structure in Python uh, that describes the system topology. So there's an example in here. Um, you define a program and then add nodes to the program that effectively represents like a service in a distributed system or like a fundamental like unit of computation that you want to run. And you know, as nodes are added to the graph, uh, Launchpad constructs like handles for each of them, representing like a client that is yet to be constructed. So you can start manipulating like the graph before actually instantiating it. Because this stuff is gonna be built on, uh, oops, like on, uh, uh, um, basically it lets you pass things around before they are constructed and, um, and you know, and, and delay the instantiation. Um, and directed edges in the graph represent communication between services. Uh, you know, in, in a way, like why, why, why do we care about this? Like, because this is a, a tool we use all the time, uh, even for very simple things, mostly because it makes it simple to reason about very complicated systems. And you want to be able to really focus on on what you're trying to solve and not the enormous complexity of everything that you need to be in place to run uh, like experiments. More on this later. And the Reverb is a similar fantastic library for setting up um, uh, experience replay like a system, like, like the ones you need for uh, RL, for example. Okay, but now, Engineering, of course, is uh, a good engineering practice uh, is impact on well, much more than enabling scale. <laughs> I would say that I'll try to show you now a few examples where I believe that um, good science is enabled by understanding the systems uh, you're working with. Yes. Yep. Uh, thank you. So um, I had a couple of questions. The first was, are these techniques viable for slightly smaller models? So, I mean, yes. not slightly, but like uh, models like Flanty 5 that work in the 3, 5 or 7 billion parameter range? Uh, so, well, so you don't need to, you don't need to uh, share those models typically. Like they fit on a single device. So. Okay. So um, most of these things are necessary when you go, go, go up in scale. All of this comes at a cost, uh, typically like synchronizing, com communication is expensive. You don't need to shard if, if things fit in. Um, um, like the, I would say that uh, data parallelism is helpful uh, like to pro process more data, but say in the example I made here, uh, said that you were running on eight GPUs, it would replicate the whole agent on all eight GPUs. You would have to basically make sure that when you initialize, you initialize from 
uh, like the same state. Uh, and then you only communicate the, like the gradients at the end, they are synchronized and then the same gradient applies to the model parameters. So that, so that things evolve coherently across replicas, right? But you don't need to like share the model themselves. They are fully replicated. Sure, yeah, thanks. And the second question was, uh, when we talk about zero specifically, um, okay. when you're storing the parameters for when you're using zero as an optimization technique, um, sorry, does that, um, sorry, does that uh, cause any trade-off with memory when you're storing a large number of parameters to optimize through zero? I'm afraid I don't understand that. what you mean by so, the in zero, uh, you had said that you store parameters and then use XLA to sort of use those parameters wherever it's necessary. So you have a memory so, efficient optimizers. What, I would say that you might want to see all of these transformations as not affecting the actual like maths that you are implementing. Did you answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You know, with the you know, there's always like the fine print of things you need to be careful, but ultimately, uh, yes, you want to preserve the same uh, mass. Yeah. So, so uh, yes, I was trying to uh, pitch why engineering is good for making good science. So a few examples. We all care about reproducibility. I'm not going to ask if you care about reproducibility. You should just care about reproducibility. Um, we all know that um, one like hairy problem is handling like randomness, like in, in sampling. And we all know that we need to be careful as you know setting random number generator seeds. Um, Sometimes, like, uh, um, say, if you are in a multi-threaded system, that's not that's not enough. When you when you have to deal with the synchronicity, uh, you may have to be more careful. And for example, need that you need to pass around uh, a separate random number generator states to threads to make sure that your experiments are actually reproducible. Another example <clears throat> is that so all, we all, I guess, have uh, run. Uh, like CNNs uh, with CUDA, uh, but by default, um, that's a not a deterministic um, operation. So one impractical solution, if you're using Torch, for example, uh, you can you know uh, set a few flags that make uh, the, co uh, the computation deterministic, but this also slows down experiments a bit uh, or a lot, and that can be impractical. Another solution is to use TPUs uh, or uh, accept like your fate in a way, uh, but you need to make sure that you need to somehow measure uncertainty you have on your results and perform like um, sensible statistical analysis, analysis of those results to make sure that, for example, you are not performance is not drifting or you're getting regressions uh, throughout your project. Another example related to reproducibility is that floating point operations are not associative. So, you know, the order in which you, I don't know, add numbers uh, matters. Um, and in large distributed system, you often have plenty of reduced operation aggregating quantities across devices. Now, even taking uh, the mean of a loss in, in a batch, uh, can be non-deterministic unless you have control of the order of your data in uh, in the mini batch. So if averaging is not done in the same order across experiments, you won't be able to reproduce them. Um, and this is pain I deal with, you know, day in day out. Um, so solutions. Well, you need to either uh, you need to ensure that you are distributing data and your use operation in a deterministic order. So deterministic data pipelines are a really big thing. Um, or corollary of this is that you need to know when determinism just cannot be achieved. For example, when you use a sync execution and the auto batching and, uh, and mitigate the effect when you uh, analyze your results. 
one more piece of reproducibility. This is interesting. So how many of you have ever run distributed RL training jobs? You don't count? Okay, so uh, I, I'll try to introduce this a bit better then. Um, so when running distributed RL, you might have uh, act like a, a whole bunch of actors running on separate machine, machines sending trajectories to a replay buffer somewhere. Um, and then you have a learner on another machine pulling data from the replay buffer. Now, if you're running these experiments in a place where there is shared computer resources, a like Google, or for example, um, where it's quite likely that your actors can be, for example, preempted, you know, for example, they'll get shut down and then they come back online later. Or in general, we, we call this the board weather, which it means like the actual load of your, of your cluster. And what we observed like empirically is that, you know, the relative speed of actors and, and learners has an, has an enormous impact on training behavior. Uh, one way of looking at this is that, you know, if you stop producing new, new data and you keep sampling from a replay, <clears throat> it's not a queue, but, you know, something where you can keep sampling very quickly, you might end up learning only from stale data. Um, and this can really make your experiments wild. Um, and I've been hit by this very badly. Um, so one way of, of uh, mitigating like these issues is to introduce this concept of throttling, meaning that you know the replay system actually checks the rate at which data comes in and out and makes sure you stay within like a, a sensible range. Uh, and throttling basically the uh, the you know the amount of learn of, of you know stepping that the learner can do. There you go. Uh, this is like, a, by the way, all of these images are borrowed from uh, papers. Uh, I really recommend you check them out if you're curious about that. Uh, this is from ACME, which is like an open source library we put out a few years ago for distributed RL. Now, let's get to things that are perhaps closer to everyday, you know, like research. So let's talk about performance and efficiency. Um, Runtime performance, like how, you know, literally word clock time uh, that you need to run your experiments has an enormous, an enormous impact on, on your work. Uh, for example, if you're faster, but it was like your inner loop of your experiments is faster, it means that, you know, you can answer more questions in the same time. Um, or if your experimental loop is cheaper, means if you can run more experiments at the same cost. If you are on a budget, uh, that really matters. And uh, just to be clear, there is a lot of resource contention in all labs. Like, I think that Francesco, the, the Francescos here can, can tell you the story that like there is, everybody wants more compute and there's never enough. So making sure that you're really squeezing everything out of the little compute or the large compute that you have really matters. An example, earlier, like uh, I showed you a picture from like Podracer. So it used to be that in the olden days of A3C on Atari, training an agent would take what, four days. Then when we moved to Impala using eight TPUs, they would take 20 minutes. That's like a 300% speed up. And using Podracer on 32 TPUs takes six minutes. So we went from four days to six minutes, which means that, you know, I remember during my PhD, I had this kind of goal of, I want to be able, you know, staying late in the lab because I wanted to run an experiment overnight. Uh, because, you know, like <clears throat> you only have uh, four years to finish. So it's really important to get, to take little steps every day. Uh, but if you take six minutes, it means that you can actually think, run some experiments, look at the result, you know, Check your, you know, verify like your hypothesis, ask a lot more questions. Um, it's, a, it's a superpower. Um, and finally, one consideration on uh, system and algorithm uh, co-design. 
So the idea is that um, like the integration of the work you do between like coming up with an idea and building a system to implement it is at the same time can be extremely powerful. In fact, sometimes an algorithm has to be designed in a way that best leverages the hardware. Like I guess Megatron is like an example. Um, I guess one cool example I would like to bring forward is um, this concept of multi-head used in Sparrow. Do you know, have you heard of Sparrow? It's a, a Sparrow is like a, a, a um, like a large language model that uh, we put out like uh, last year, and um, and the the team didn't have access to as much you know uh, compute as perhaps they would have liked, so they had to come up with a ways of being able to do like do work efficiently, um, and to mitigate the memory requirements for multiple. Because they basically had to run multiple very large chinchilla models at the same time. For example, they needed multiple reward models. They needed like a, like a policy uh, network, a value network, a number of feature models, and they all had to fit uh, in device memory. So what they did <clears throat> is to train on top of um, uh, basically train only the top layer of a model and share like the torso of the networks across models. That's the that's hence the you know the number of multi head or Hydra model. Um, so shared torso in a separately trained head for each model. Uh, very it's a very like interesting description. I recommend you check out the paper. Any more any questions about this? This section. Can we move on. Great. So by, by now, I really hope I've persuaded you that a lot of the engineering goes into enabling and improving research. So I guess the next question could be, okay, that's all good, but um, how should I invest my time in engineering to enable my master's, my PhD, my, my job, and how can I improve my jobs? I would like to put all these questions on their, you know, flip them on their head and ask you, What's your mission? Why are you like doing your work? What are your priorities? Because the sole purpose of everything I discussed so far in general, of building infrastructure and, and writing code is to serve your research. That's the only purpose. Like the, it's not engineering for engineering sake. It's about creating value for your mission. For example, if your mission is research, 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 that should be like, like you're not like your compass and how like you decide to invest your time. <clears throat> I personally think that like a good code and that your code should help you think clearly and it should afford you to ask better and more focused questions. You want to be able to retrieve and store the right data that lets you look at the results and find precise answers and enable both speed of iteration and confidence in your results. You know, um, the colleague, like that unfortunately left for OpenAI and um, when he left, uh, uh, he shared some notes of the lessons that he learned over uh, a few years at, at the mine. And uh, I remember you said something along the lines of, you know, to always prefer code abstractions that represent objects that would exist in a visual diagram of your system and avoid abstractions that only are there to make other abstractions happen. So avoid doing over-engineering. Um, and also don't let anyone tell you what is better or I said that one is better than the other. It's a balance and every uh, every piece of work, you know, lies on a different part of this scale of reusability and safety and interpretability of your code. Um, corollary of this, uh, that there always be something better and more powerful and flexible designed by others than the stuff that you're using. But is it, is it better? 
uh, what makes code better is only how it serves your research. So never, never let the allure of better infrastructure convince you to make like big changes to the default behavior of your code or what you're working on. Uh, and always be careful and wait until, you know, uh, better infrastructures prove itself and matches performance of what you, really have, what you have already. Close is not enough. Corollary number two, and this could be a bit counterintuitive, is that it is okay to be scrappy, especially if you're working alone or in a small team. Uh, you know, aim at getting to results quickly and iterate from there. Iterate, iterate. In a way, this is the only way you can enable failing fast. Failure is a quintessential part of research, uh, and you want to basically make sure that you know you can discard bad ideas or bad directions very quickly um corollary of this is that you really cannot own the full stack um like it's a fact you don't have enough bandwidth to do everything and you need to be uh, ruthless in prioritizing your work um in practice i would suggest you need to focus on one question at a time uh, and then uh, make sure you can trust the pipeline uh, to do its job. Now, what do you mean? Because, you know, there are two words in here. There's owning and trusting. Uh, and I want to try to offer some operational definitions of ownership and trust. So when I say that you own your infra, I mean that you understand everything. Like understanding everything means that you should be able to make an arbitrary change and predict the behavior of your code. This is ownership. Or, you know, this, sometimes an educated desk will have to do, but this is the sort of level of confidence you need to have in your in code you own. Trusting other people's code means that you know what it does. You need to know what it's doing, but not necessarily, you know, to the fine details of how it is doing. Anything less is not enough. You fundamentally, what I'm trying to suggest is that you really must understand your code base, uh, which is going to make it possible for you to pick up if something is off. And when something is off, we can't afford to just ignore it. It's not unusual uh, to be hit by long standing bugs that you saw months earlier and you just didn't stop to investigate because things were working. Uh, and this is like a, an extremely frustrating experience that can invalidate days of work, months of work. That's brutal. Um, you know, how do you fix this? Well, you need to run baselines all the time. You have to be diligent and track changes. When do you run baseline? Well, ideally yesterday, uh, failing that today is better than uh, leaving things to tomorrow. Yeah. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that this is easy, like both owning and getting to a place where you can really trust the code is extremely hard work, but it is worth it. And there is huge value in practicing like this level of self-discipline. Uh, because it gives you confidence that, you know, your results are actually correct. Um, it makes it possible to, uh, you know, capture what you don't know and design better experiments. Um, conversely, you know, there are huge costs in lowering the bar of one research workflow. Um, so how do we get there? So uh, this section is going to be extremely opinionated and it reflects my approach to writing code and debugging. So take it or leave it, uh, but I get to speak, so. Um, so assumptions of this, uh, they're very strong. Uh, so code is ultimately how you project your ideas into something that runs on a machine. That's the only way where you go. Um, and you will not get it right the first time around. Um, and you will have to do a lot of debugging. Um, 
I guess we can all agree on this. Um, now the question is, how do we make this productive and uh, enjoyable? Um, the the name of the game is being defensive. Um, it is, you know, ultimately you are the only one who knows your stuff and your level of expertise and what you're comfortable with. Uh, so each one of us has to approach problems very differently based on our expertise. Um, in my team, there are engineers like much, much stronger than me and, uh, and they can move faster and attack more complex problems than what they can do. Uh, but this doesn't mean that I can't be, you know, as productive by making sure that I reduce complexity to the point where, you know, I can own the process uh, and the bug problems. Um, and how you set this up is that you need to invest the right time into infrastructure that makes it easier for you to reduce the complexity uh, of the bugs you see the most. Um, uh, this guy who left um, actually had a very, he would say, he used to say that there are roughly four categories of bugs uh, or questions, you know, questions that can be answered in less than two minutes, questions that can be answered within an hour, questions that can be answered today, and questions that take longer. And so like, your goal is to make sure that, you know, most of your debugging questions fall into category, you know, one and two. Uh, and invest time in infrastructure that make your bugs mostly fall in those categories. Uh, and that's very true. Um, now, you know, uh, also delegate complexity, which is, you know, do not reinvent the wheel. But sometimes you will have to build something new. Um, and you can be defensive in how you approach building something new. You want to break it down into a series of small reversible changes, possibly, on top of something which is well understood and tested so that you own like a smaller portion of the problem. And then again, you run baseline, baselines as frequently as possible and test as much as possible. Um, also, it's clear that you will need a time machine to go back and forth to previous experiments. So I highly recommend versioning for your code. Um, now, another very helpful question uh, is, you know, you need to know your time frames. So in all of this, like how much time it takes you to get to a point where you can get to results always matters. You know, uh, there is like the argument I made earlier about failing fast, but also you want to make sure you get some signal, you keep yourself engaged and excited, you get, you know, some small wins. Or if you're working in a team, you want to be able to, uh, you know, collaborate effectively. Um, so over time, it's super important to, you know, develop your skill to be able to estimate how long it's gonna take you before you can start delivering results uh, and use that to make certain calls. And in fact, you should also reassess the value of your project if your time estimates are consistently off. Uh, if you thought that, oh, this is going to take me a week, then, you know, well, you are three weeks in, you know, you should ask yourself, okay, is this worth it? Because sometimes you may just better to shout the thing and move on. All right. How am I make, doing with time? Good. Okay. So I would like to share one final remark. Um, and I want to go back to the importance of, of, your, of the mission. Um, a lot of the things I suggested in these last few slides are a pain uh, and require a lot of discipline and time. It, it's really, you know, it's it's really hard work. I mean, when I these are also like ideals for me, and I'm you know I'm I'm working towards that. It's not like I I'm not trying to preach, uh, but you know, again, there are still means to to an end and the mission, which should be like research is what truly, truly matters. And uh, my, my part in you know, recommendation is that you should really ensure that your goals are something you truly, truly care about um, and something that makes all the effort you put it into it worth it. And uh, you own this like nobody else. 
not your supervisor. So um, yes, um, try to make clarity about that. And uh, that's it. Thank you.